Hey guys, Modsy here, back with another video, and today we're going to be taking a look back to check out NVIDIA's powerhouse chip of the NV20, otherwise known as the GeForce 3. Now before we dive into the GeForce 3 specs and performance, let's get some perspective on the video card landscape leading up to the release of the GeForce 3. NVIDIA had clear market dominance with their GeForce 2 product line. They had a GPU, no matter how big or small your budget was. Meaning other companies that only had one or two current generation cards in their arsenal couldn't keep up with how attractive a GeForce 2 card was at the time. Not to mention that the GeForce 2 cards love to be overclocked for even more performance per dollar. But one of the main appeals for going green was driver and game support. Nvidia was starting to work directly with game developers, making sure their cards worked to their best ability on the latest games. Meaning release day performance was almost always good. So at this point NVIDIA was growing its market share. ATI was working on their own new cards, and other companies like PowerVR moved out of the desktop space to work on mobile. The other big name in the desktop GPU market was of course 3DFX, who was about to be bought out by NVIDIA. But that's a whole other kettle of fish. So in January 2001, at the Macworld conference, live on stage, John Carmack showcased the power of the GeForce 3 and how it was aiding them in designing the next generation game engine, id Tech 4, which was the engine behind, of course, Doom 3. Alright, what I've got here is a demonstration of our new in-development gaming engine, and this shows off some of the things that we can do with the power of the GeForce 3 in here. And all of this is actual real game code, there's no real special tricks going on here, everything is being done real time. So the big trick that we're getting now is the final unification of lighting and shadowing across all surfaces in a game. These games have had to do these hacks and tricks for years now where we do different things for characters and different things for environments and different things for lights that move versus lights that are static. And now we're able to do all of that the same way for everything. We're able to go ahead and apply all of these on every single pixel rather than every vertex or even every object like we used to do. I mean, things that we always wanted to see, like, you know, every light casts its own highlight, every surface casts its shadow, just the way you would expect things to behave in the real world on there. We're able to do all of these really dramatic things with, you know, bringing out so much detail, projecting lights onto things. Uh, you know, specular highlights on a per pixel basis, just wonderful things for games, where instead of having everything where this, this clear distinction between things that you interact with and things that, uh, that are static in the world, everything behaves the same now. And look at the detail that we're able to get. These are our game characters. These aren't special high resolution models that we're using for something. You know, it wasn't too many years ago when we were lucky to have three triangles for a nose on our character. And now we've got like pores and moles. And uh, oh, incidentally, we do do all of our animation with Maya also. So these animation loops that we've done here were, uh, were created in Maya. So we're very excited about the quality that we get here. I mean, this is like, these are the characters for our next game, some of them. And just the detail that you can see in there, we're extremely excited here. And the large scale dynamic things, like we can move lights all over the place. We can have highlights change on everything, shadows moving every which way. And we can bring cinematic drama to a lot of the things in the game now. We can do these extremely moody, intense, and scary things. And we're not just limited to moving a couple things around inside uh, you know, a static little game world. I, I mean, every, every time I look at what our artists can do with this new stuff, I'm just extremely pleased with like, what our next project's gonna look like. I, it's a wonderful time to be in graphics. And GeForce 3 is just uh, the most exciting thing in years that we've had to work with. We're able to do just fabulous stuff with it. Mm. It's great. Mm. So the first version of the NV20 core would release in February simply labelled the GeForce 3. It has a core speed of 200 MHz and 64 MB of DDR1 clocked at 230 MHz. It featured the same 4 pixel pipelines as the previous generation had and was shrunk down to a 150nm fab process and supported DirectX 8.0. The card also came with a new integrated memory controller, NVIDIA called Lightspeed Memory Architecture, or LMA for short. So why was John Carmack so excited about the GeForce 3? Well, NVIDIA had also designed the NV20 chip to be the world's first GPU that featured 3D programmable shaders, dubbed the Infinite FX Engine. This was a huge step forward in the gaming industry, and why games pre-2001 look so much older than games that were built from the ground up using this kind of shader technology. Take Castle Wolfenstein, for example, as you see on screen at the moment. This game was released in 2001 using the id Tech 3 engine. 
Now compare this directly against Doom 3, built from the ground up using the id Tech 4 engine. To the uninformed, these games look almost 10 years apart in terms of graphical technology. Now ATI had been quietly working on their next chip that would directly compete with the GeForce 3, and six months later in August 2001, the Radeon 85 hit shelves and review outlet bench tops. The Radeon 8500 was not built to match the GeForce 3's performance and feature set, on paper, it was meant to be outright beating it. However, poor driver support meant that the card initially launched with what looked like tons of untapped potential. And this meant Nvidia was genuinely worried about the performance gain ATI could make with the Radeon 8500, given better driver support. So later in the year, Nvidia went on to release two new versions of the GeForce 3. The TI200 model with its lower clock speed and lower RAM speed was competing against the Radeon 7500, while the TI500 model, with its higher clock speed and higher RAM speed, was taking on the mighty Radeon 8500, and it was a tough dogfight between these two for the performance crown, both trading blows depending on the type of game or application you're running. Now the other issue that both these companies actually faced, which is something that really doesn't happen these days, is the fact that Microsoft was actually releasing very rapid versions or updated versions of the DirectX API faster than newer cards could actually keep up with the technology. And on this front, the Radeon 85 had a slight edge over NVIDIA as it supported DirectX 8.1, while the GeForce 3 was limited to just the base version of DirectX 8. But this advantage would soon be meaningless, as Microsoft had actually announced that the next major version of DirectX 9, uh, the, the, this new standard, would actually be coming in 2002, making these cards almost obsolete within 12 months of their release. So come the end of 2001, both companies were in a situation where they could either embrace and take a lot longer to develop a brand new chip for the brand new API, or they could respond as quickly as possible to regain and make sure they control the GPU market. And this is where Nvidia kind of got caught off guard, because they decided to just revise the NV20 core and dubbed it the NV25, and this was the GeForce 4 product line, but sadly this meant that they were limited to DirectX 8.1 at a time where a lot of games were shifting over to uh, DirectX 9 because of its very vast range of features. ATI decided to take a bit of time and actually build a brand new core from the ground up, the R300, which was actually the heart of the almighty and all-conquering Radeon 9700 Pro. But that's a story for another day. So now you know all this info, are these cards suitable if you're planning to build a retro Windows 98 or XP gaming PC today? Well, this is slightly tricky, and it depends a lot on the OS, CPU platform, and of course the era of games you're wanting to play. If you're building a gaming system dedicated to 2001 games and 2001 hardware, the GeForce 3 TI500 is probably one of your clear choices to find to just say you've had the ultimate video card. It's also one of the rarest and hardest to find, making your build rather stand out and be a little bit unique. But if you're just building a Windows 98 retro PC or even a Windows XP retro PC and you're not really phased on exactly a specific model of video card and you're just looking for something with really good performance to play a good range of cards from the 90s and early 2000s, something like a Radeon 9800 Pro is probably one of the best choices you can have. Low power consumption, low heat output, very good performance and compatible with both Windows 98 and Windows XP alike and good driver support as well. If, however, you're specifically just set on getting a TI500 model for a video card collection or it's the card you really want to have for your retro gaming PC build, you can end up paying several hundreds of dollars for these off eBay, especially if they're from an AIB partner like Hercules or Asus or one of the others that are out there that were consumer retail versions of the card. If you really want to stick with Team Green, however, you can actually pick up a GeForce 4 TI4200 off eBay for really, really cheap, and there's a lot of different models and different versions out there. Just do a bit of research and find one with a good cooler and good compatibility as well. But these support DirectX 8.1 and have slightly more performance than a GeForce 3 TI500. However, you can do what I did and be a little bit sneaky. Because I wanted a reference model TI500 for my GPU collection, I went and looked up the model numbers for the OEM cards sold to companies like Dell, Compaq, etc. designed for workstation PCs. These can simply be labelled on eBay as GeForce followed by a part number or Dell GeForce 3 or, or you know, Compaq GeForce 3, something like that followed by a part number. Or they might just have GeForce with a part number. Now this reference design is also considered to be the most desirable version for purist GPU collectors as it features the most iconic NVIDIA green PCB and green heatsink and fan design. Now I'm not going to be simply just providing you with part numbers so you can go off and find these cards yourself and there's a couple of big reasons for this. 
um, like many collectors, we actually really do highly value our collection and the time that it actually takes to find some of these rarer and more harder to find cards. For me, a big part of you know the passion and the hobby that I have, you know, the the, the love that I have for this, uh, you know, collecting is the time and effort that it actually takes to find the, some of these cards that I have in my collection. The research into finding part numbers and things like that because people mislabel them on eBay without realizing it, not knowing what they have, is a big part of the thrill of being, you know, finding, you know, stumbling across something and being like, oh my god, what is that? Oh, that is exactly what I've been looking for, and then getting it for an absolute bargain. Now this keeps the value and the rarity of these items high. It means that if you really do value these items like other collectors do, I know that the effort that you will put into finding these will actually be meaningful when you do actually find one. It took me several years to actually find a very good condition reference model, uh, G4 6800 Ultra AGP for example. So in summary, the GeForce 3 was a tremendous success for NVIDIA. With Microsoft using an iteration of it in their very successful entry into the console space, and NVIDIA retaining the ultimate desktop performance crown for the third consecutive generation. It was by all means the ultimate video card for the era. Stay tuned for our next Retro GPU History video, where we take a look at how ATI came out swinging, hitting NVIDIA hard with the utterly dominant R300 chip, as I mentioned earlier, the heart of the Radeon 9700 Pro. This was a beast of a card and it really did shake NVIDIA for a couple of generations. So thanks for watching guys, I hope you've really enjoyed this step into the past. If you're like me and really enjoy you know, this era of PC hardware and just how awesome the race was between the companies and the fights that were going on, uh, this sort of stuff, you know, it's really enjoyable to read and, and learn all about. Especially if you're a more you know, modern gamer and you weren't building PC hardware back then, because these days things are a little bit boring. But look, feel free to subscribe, I've got loads more videos coming up on this era of hardware, so look, thanks for watching again, and I'll catch you in the next one. Oh.